Hi everyone, welcome to MD VOD, your health live and on demand here on EmpowerMe.TV. I'm Dr. John Kennedy and today we're talking about the health of your eyes and vision. Our ability to see is an important part of our overall health, yet we tend to take our eyes and vision for granted. Worldwide, between 300 and 400 million people have problems with their vision and approximately 50 million people are totally blind. The leading causes of blindness include complications from diabetes, macular degeneration, and traumatic injuries. And in third world countries, where about 85% of the world's blindness occurs, the causes are infections, cataracts, glaucoma, and inability to obtain eyeglasses. As we do each week, we'll help you better understand about your health of your eyes and vision. We'll first take a look at the risks of developing problems with your vision, the most common symptoms, how to make a diagnosis, and then we'll discuss treatments and therapies. Finally, we'll talk about whether insurance providers cover the costs associated with your visual health. And later today, we'll be joined by board-certified ophthalmologist, Dr. Brian boxer Walkler, who will help arm you with information to help protect your eyes and maintain visual health. Up next, we'll learn about the anatomy of your eyes. Welcome back to MD VOD. In order to have a thorough understanding of our vision, it helps to know the anatomy of our eye. The outer part of our eye is known as the cornea, which is a lot like the lens cap on a camera. The light then gets bent and sent through our pupil, which is the black circle in our eye that allows light in, which is like the aperture on the camera, and then sends it through the lens, which brings the light into focus, just like the lens on a camera. The light then goes to the back of our eye, sort of like the film that processes the light and changes it into a chemical, sends it back through the optic nerve to the visual center of the brain, which allows us to see. Make sure to join us next when we're joined by board certified ophthalmologist, Dr. Brian boxer Walkler. We're back on MDVOD and today we're talking about our visual health or eye health. And we're here with board certified ophthalmologist, Dr. Brian boxer Walkler. Hey Brian, thanks for coming. It's a pleasure. Thanks so much pleasure. to be here. Hey, so what is or what should we know about our eye health? Eye health is an important concept and a lot of people don't really think about their eye health. They think about their cardiac health, their heart health, and all the other parts of the body. But it's amazing how many people like never think about their eyes and mm -hmm. going in for their eye exam to get their eyes checked. So eye health is the concept of making sure that your eyes are not having any diseases, diseases that you may not even know about that might be silent and having and maintaining good vision and particularly doing things that can help you maintain your good vision in the future. That's great, great advice. So um, a question I have and I'm sure many have, um, what's the difference between an optometrist and an ophthalmologist? Great question and the difference is that an optometrist is a doctor of the eyes and they have gone to optometry school so they learn all about the health of the eyes, managing diseases and understanding diseases um, for the most part. Uh, an ophthalmologist is a doctor who went to medical school. Mm -hmm. So they have an MD after their name uh, as an easy des designation versus an optometrist that has an OD. And the ophthalmologist, after medical school, they did a residency which also involves surgery training. Mm -hmm of how to treat diseases and manage problems surgically of the eyes. Mm -hmm. um, in a simplistic way, the optometrist can do medical management of most diseases, whereas an ophthalmologist can do medical management as well as surgical management mm -hmm. of eye diseases. That's a great, great explanation, thanks. Um, and you know, what, what is the most common cause of blindness? Well, probably the most common cause of blindness in the United States has to be macular degeneration. Um, macular degeneration is a disease that affects the very center part of the retina, as you nicely explained earlier. The retina is like the film in the back of a camera. And it, the area called the macula is the central part responsible for center of vision. It starts to break down and degenerate 
and that causes loss of central vision. And um, it's people don't technically go blind all the way, mm -hmm. but they can't see a certain range on the chart, so they're considered at that point legally blind. Hmm. Um, mm. But it doesn't cause complete blindness. Mm. Do you think most of that is influenced by driving? Is that is that why we say legally blind, or what is that? Where do you think, you know, we get that information from? I think it probably comes from the um, definition um, set out by the ophthalmology mm. um, community for you know legal blindness mm. in terms of um, obviously one can't drive if you both eyes are in that category mm -hmm. but um, it's it's a way to put a frame around something that otherwise is really hard to understand in terms of you know blindness because it's such an amorphous word but this gives us a concrete way to define it based on the visual acuity on the chart. In a standard way, I would imagine, like if you're somewhere in the rest of the world, there's a standard way to say if you're legally blind or not. That's true, that's true, mm -hmm. because the definition is being 2200 mm -hmm. vision on the chart or worse mm -hmm. than that. Okay. So you're right, it does give a easy to transfer definition uh, across states or even across countries. Mm -hmm. Okay, hey, so, um, Sometimes I hear uh, uh, my patients complain of this, and I, and I don't know, I want to know. Um, they get a sudden pain uh, in their eye. Is there anything that causes that that's a common cause of a sudden pain in your eye? Probably the most common cause might be if somebody has uh, a little flick of, uh, of dust or something, a speck mm -hmm. of dust that gets in there. And when they blink over the surface, it feels like there's maybe a little pebbly feeling. Mm -hmm. And if that's the case, most times it's just gonna go away. But another very common cause of that sensation is having dry eyes. And dry eyes is where the lubrication on the surface of the, the eye is not up to par. So the eyes get this sandy feeling mm -hmm. and it's because of dryness. So that's mm -hmm. a very common cause of that sensation that you described is dry eyes. Mm -hmm. So. Um, once you get referred to you, the ophthalmologist, by let's say it's an internist or um, you know a, a, an emergency room doctor, um, what typically happens when you go to get your eyes examined? Well, you're going to have your vision checked. You're going to have the pressure in your eye checked, and that's for screening for glaucoma. You're going to make sure that your pupils, as you described, the black centers are moving properly and there's no problems with that. Checking the muscle movements, uh, visual fields, um, and other parts of the eye itself, doing a direct exam of the eye from front to back, basically. Mm -hmm. So, and that's to make sure that there's no diseases that might be silent. Glaucoma, for example, is a silent disease. It's like a thief in the night stealing mm -hmm. people's vision. Mm -hmm. And until the very end stage of glaucoma, people would have no idea that they had it because mm -hmm. it's very subtle in the beginning. Mm -hmm. But a good test can pick that up. When, you're, when you diagnose glaucoma, um, how do you treat it? Well, the first line treatment is typically with eye drops that are designed to lower the pressure because glaucoma is a condition where the pressure in the eye is typically too high and that causes loss of the peripheral vision in the beginning stages. So mm -hmm. the first treatment is to use drops that lower the pressure and most times that does keep it under control. Okay. And um, before you mentioned something so common, uh, which is dry eyes, I mean, what, what do you recommend for people with, with dry eyes? Well, the most simple remedy is using over-the-counter uh, eye drops. And preservative-free eye drops for a number of people even work better. Um, you can also take oral flax oil capsules, mm. or the oil, mm -hmm. and that helps internally hydrate the eyes. And there's a treatment we've been doing, it's not as well recognized um, in use by other eye doctors, but we've been doing this for many years using a testosterone hormone cream, wow. applying it to the eyelids because there's a condition called blepharitis, which is a fancy way of saying acne of the eyelids, essentially, teenage eyelids when people get older. Mm -hmm. And that can cause dry eyes too. And the testosterone treatment in our experience has just worked uh, magic for people that have that cause of dry eyes. So testosterone, is it an, it's an ointment, like uh, cream-like? It's a cream, it's a cream, and it's applied mm -hmm. to the eyelids. Mm -hmm. So not in the eye, but on the eyelids, and mm -hmm. that gets into the glands to help unclog those glands. Because oh, wow. actually the underlying cause of blepharitis, 
lot of the basic science has shown this, but for some reason, most doctors in practice just aren't aware of it. But the underlying cause is a hormone imbalance. Wow. Not enough testosterone to the estrogen level. So there's that hormone imbalance, which is why this cream is so effective at equalizing it and treating oh, it's it. It's fascinating stuff. So uh, new stuff, uh, the, the testosterone cream possibly uh, helping with blepharitis or the acne of the eyelids, as Dr. Uh, Boxer Wachler tells us. Um, I just got to jump in real quick because yeah. I know people are wondering, well, if I put testosterone, am I going to get a, women especially, am I going to get a mustache and then big mm -hmm. muscles? Mm -hmm. And the answer is no. Mm -hmm. It just works locally. Oh, that's great. Interesting stuff. Um, you know, this, all this treatment and diagnosis, um, all the therapies you include, you talked uh, briefly about, you know, surgeries that you might do for someone's eyes. It, it can get pretty expensive. Um, what do you recommend uh, and, and what are ways that you think we could decrease cost um, for our eye care? It's a great question and I think there's no simple answer. We're not going to have the answer today. Mm -hmm. But I think one of the things for decreasing costs is to um, consolidate some form of what's available out there. Hmm. Um, you've got so many, and I'm actually not talking from the provider or the doctor side, I'm talking actually more from the insurance side, hmm. because there's so many different versions of insurances that people have, and there's so much paperwork and bureaucracy involved mm -hmm. um, that it helps add to those costs. Mm -hmm. And so, but I would say one thing is a little subtle tip here, mm -hmm. If someone has insurance and they get denied by their insurance company for treatment, let's say they've already gone through and they, their insurance denies them or they're trying to get pre-approval and mm -hmm. they get denied, mm -hmm. I would definitely let people know that there is an appeals process to the insurance system. So if you've gotten denied for whatever reason for a treatment, you do have the right to appeal that even up to the insurance commissioner of your state. Wow, great so advice. The insurance wow. companies aren't gonna want me saying this, but That's great we're advice. here, yeah. is, I'm, I'm always been an advocate for patients. And if you have to go to the insurance commissioner of your state in an appeal, you should do that. That's a great point. So, uh, you know, you heard it here. Um, you can, you know, the, it sounds like there's governmental backing uh, to, to help um, get more uh, uh, information and, and, and help with your vision. Um, a question I have is, you know, you mentioned it early. Uh, we, we take our vision for granted. You know, we wake up every day, we see every day. What, what can you recommend for kids um, so that they don't take their vision for granted? Is there any kind of preventative measures you might teach kids? Absolutely, and the background for my answer, do you want the answer first or the background first? I think both are great. Okay. <laughs> so, They'll love it. <laughs> so the biggest thing for kids, and they're gonna fight you on this, tooth and nail, make them get in the habit of wearing sunglasses outside. Be, and the reason is, is because the sun damage that occurs when, you know, young boys and girls are playing outside, especially, you know, when it's nice weather or they're swimming and hanging out by the pool or the beach, that sun damage accumulates over the years. And it, for a number of kids, as they become adults, they end up getting a disease um, of the eyes called chronic bloodshot eyes. Hmm. And they can, as adults, become very self-conscious of that. We have developed a treatment for that called the Eyebright procedure that helps mm -hmm. surgically repair that damage. But I always tell parents of our patients when they have kids is get their kids in the habit of wearing sunglasses to help prevent this from happening. That's great advice. You know, have kids wear sunglasses. That's, that's incredible stuff. Do you want another tip for kids? Absolutely. So there's a number of people who have a condition called keratoconus, which is where the cornea which is the, like you said, the lens cap or the outer windshield of the eye bulges out. There's a percentage of those people where their children will develop this condition. And if you have keratoconus or you know someone who does, who has children, make, make sure they get in, the kids get in around age 10 to start getting annual eye checkups to be screened for keratoconus. Because if it's caught early, it can be treated before any vision loss occurs. Wow. Great advice for parents and kids. Um, I want to thank Dr. Brian Boxer Walkler for that outstanding information about our eye health. And if you missed anything, make sure you go to empowerme.tv to catch all this great information about our eyes and, and our vision. 
Um, and join us next on Apple A Day when we'll learn ways to prevent problems with our eye health. We're back with an Apple A Day with common sense tips to help you with your vision. Studies now show that your mom was actually right. The vitamins and carrots and brightly colored fruits and vegetables actually help protect your eyes. And antioxidants that are found in many fruits and vegetables actually inhibit damage to the eyes by protecting the retina and lens. Another simple way to protect your eyes and vision is to always wear sunglasses with high quality ultraviolet light protection and be sure to stay on top of the latest news regarding visual health at cdc.gov because the more you know, the more successful you'll be in protecting and preserving your eyesight. Thank you very much for joining us and I hope you found this information about your visual health helpful. I'm Dr. John Kennedy and you're watching MD VOD, your health live and on demand here on empowerme.tv. And don't forget to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and share us with your family and friends. And now for any episodes you might have missed, they're available at the empowerme.tv website and the YouTube channel. And be sure to leave us any comments and questions so that we can better help you deal with your disease. We'll see you next time on MDVOD.